Um, so welcome along to our first one uh, meeting of 2022. Um, and we've got a, a fairly packed agenda today. Um, we have, uh, let's flick on to the next slide. So we have Kate Steele from the Irish Hospital Foundation, um, who is going to be talking about the new National Nursing Home Programme, um, which is supporting palliative end of life care. And uh, we're going to have Martin Cormican from the HSE um, talking about normalising visiting in long-term residential care facilities. And then we're going to have our own Dominic Campbell as well talking about the new arts and wellbeing tools for frontline staff. And we're just going to do a few little updates and uh, things as well, just to do with our own cure program here as, as usual. And um, just to highlight as well that we have our reflection survey that's happening at the moment. And um, this has been going on now for the last few months with for the Irish Hospital Foundation um, across uh, across all sectors uh, in the Irish community where we're, we're looking for feedback from, from bereaved relatives or anybody to do with anybody who's suffered bereavement in the last a couple of years, um, especially when it comes to... No. We have um, also, we're having a bit few difficulties maybe accessing certain groups that we're trying to connect with. And one big part that I know that has been a bit of an issue uh, trying to get respondents for well, while we have had over one and a half thousand respondents across all our communities is is reaching older people in in nursing home and residential care settings is tending to be a bit of a challenge i think we only have one respondent so far and um, from that area and um, it for multiple reasons it can be down to that you know it's, it's an online survey as such but we do have it in paper format that we can send out to centers um, of course, it's a, it, it can be a sensitive topic and stuff for, for people to be dealing with, but uh, we would encourage centres who believe, you know, for any residents that might be in any of the residential care facilities that are here today, who would be interested maybe in filling out that survey, that we can pass it on, we can send out and both the digital copy, which is going into the, the chat function there now, and we can also mail out hard copies to centres as well. So if there's anybody that you think that would benefit from this or would like, possibly like to and give their feedback, we'd encourage people to, to reach out and we can send on the hard copies to you. Um, again, there is the, the you'll see the hospitalfoundation.e time uh, for reflect as well is also there if you need to go find it, it's online also. Um, also to highlight that our usual culture and communication and the life care uh, workshop that we have been, that's still ongoing as such that we can uh, support centres with uh, up and down the country. Uh, this is a workshop designed for staff working in nursing home and residential care uh, centres. And we talk about a focus on communication skills to support and enable all staff engage with residents and plan for end of life care. Um, it is a one day or two half day interactive sessions via Zoom. So if your centre, if you're looking for, it, it's roughly anywhere between eight to 12 staff is roughly the amount that we say, you know, we'll, we'll make a good workshop with that. Um, but what we are doing now currently also is we have um, the ability now as well to bring a number of centres together. So if you have maybe only one or two staff, because we understand that staffing is a challenge at the moment, and especially releasing staff uh, for training and things can be a challenge, that uh, we can have one or two or three from a number of centres can come together on one particular training and, and we can organise that. We, we will be sending out the dates and we have sent a few emails, I think, there to centres. Um, if you're interested in it, you can register for those, um, those workshops in advance and the staff will be sent out all the, the workbooks and relevant information. Uh, if you have any further questions, you can contact Keol at hospicefoundation.ie. Um, just to talk, uh, oh, sorry, I think we've gone past this, this slide for introducing Kate there now. Oh, there we go. So introducing as well, we've got Kate here, Kate Steele from our Irish Hospice Foundation, who is going to be talking and leading us through the National Nursing Home Programme um, for supporting palliative and end of life care. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, and welcome, everybody. And I am just going to share my screen um, and we'll press the begin. OK, so again, thank you very much. And thank everybody uh, for, I suppose, joining us today at our first network for uh, 2022. Um, and I suppose on behalf of the Irish Hospice Foundation, the All-Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care and the HSE, we are, we are delighted to be letting you know that we are in the process of developing a national nursing home programme that will support palliative and end-of-life care. Sorry, now just moving things around the screen. And 
how we got here, I think, is a testament to all of the staff, to the hard work and recognition that has actually gone on in nursing homes, um, especially over the last two years. Um, the Irish Hospice Foundation and the All-Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care, we have been running two programmes uh, for a number of years now, the Kyol, which is our Compassion End of Life, and the Project ECHO. Um, and again, it's thanks to centres that supported uh, the implementation and the running of these programmes, because without your commitment, we wouldn't really have been able to go to the HSE um, and to the Department of Health and say, listen, we want to I suppose, focus on the work that's been done in nursing homes and focus on palliative and end of life care. Part of it as well came from the nursing home, the COVID-19 nursing home expert panel report. And obviously it made a recommendation that a joint HSE IHF collaborative national program on palliative end of life and bereavement care for nursing homes and for the nursing home sector that engages all stakeholders and improves quality of care across the sector. So this is where, this is part of where we were able to go and say, listen, we need to actually now look at and focus and support um, end of life and palliative care in nursing homes. Um, it was recommended that it be established similar and along the lines of our hospice friendly hospital program. So the aim of the program is to improve the delivery of compassionate, person-centered, palliative, end-of-life and bereavement care in nursing homes. And we're hoping to do this through a nationally mandated, a well-designed, multi-stranded, multi-layered, and you'll see that now in a slide or two down the, in the coming, an integrated quality improvement program that will enable all nursing homes to engage at a level that's appropriate to them. We have a number of objectives that I, I might just go through them quickly, but we want to ensure that the delivery of compassionate, person-centered, palliative, end-of-life and bereavement care to residents of nursing homes, which is appropriate to their needs and their wishes. To ensure that families are provided with compassionate support and subject to the resident's consent, given information before, during and after the resident's death and to promote and support a compassionate culture within the nursing home where the delivery of excellence in palliative end of life and bereavement care is a source of pride and is a valued and recognised part of the day-to-day -day ethos and work and life of that nursing home. To improve the competence, confidence, resilience of staff in nursing homes. And I think the resilience is really, really important in light of the last two years uh, to deliver excellent, compassionate, palliative, end of life and bereavement care. Um, and again, in particular, supporting staff with the ability to engage with residents on advanced care planning and end of life care planning as per the resident's wishes. Uh, these objectives as well are, are equally important, but probably more organisational, uh, to play a role in supporting better two-way communication between the individual nursing home and the clinical supports for palliative and end-of-life and bereavement care that already exist within the community. We also want to establish robust national and uh, regional infrastructure. Um, we also we're going to look at the partnership-based approach similar to the hospital-friendly hospital model and obviously we are going to put in place measures to, I suppose, monitor and evaluate the programme um, as it's rolled out and as it's, um, I suppose, over the next five years. So that's a lot there in the objectives, but how will it work? And without getting too complicated, what we're kind of looking at is, if you see at the bottom of the pyramid, um, we have kind of the national office. So the national office will lead with national initiatives and will lead and support the programme. And then at the blue, we call it, I'm calling it strand A, we're hoping to have, or we, we envisage having a portal, a web portal, where there's access to materials and information um, that would be available to the public, to residents, families, and members of staff. And again, it's what information you need, having it accessible for you there um, at real time. And again, there'll be a lot of work done in collaborating with, um, I suppose, partners in this, in that some information is already out there so that we can actually pool it all together and just make that kind of one-stop shop for people. Strand B then is the national network. So this would be an example of one of the networks where staff, and again, we are always encouraging that multidisciplinary team approach. Like it can be how it can be nursing, administration, household, porters, catering, anybody we feel have a role to play in end of life care, that they can access the networks. Um, you know, virtual ones. We're hoping to go back to regional networks where we'll be able to meet on site in a region, um, where you can link with your work colleagues, link with your colleagues in nursing homes down the road and do that peer support and shared learning, which is really, really invaluable. And again, I think a level of supporting each other as well. 
we will be, um, and the All-Ireland Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care will lead on six webinars uh, per year for nursing home staff as well. So that's kind of the level B. At level C or strand C, the project echoes and the QO quality improvement programs. This is These are the pieces where we're combining the programs together to support um, the delivery and the end of life care in nursing homes and to support what you're already doing. And then strand D we have is a network between existing centres, so existing community services, um, specialist palliative care hospices, stuff you're doing already, but just to support you with and build a kind of a structure around it. So again, there's a question about how are we going to do all that? We have been successful in actually getting funding for nine regional coordinators for the National Nursing Home Programme. So we are hoping that around the country we'll have nine coordinators that will support the development and the implementation and the linking and supporting ye in nursing homes and supporting palliative and end of life care. Um, this isn't a development phase at the moment because we're, we're, we're looking at where they'd be housed and you know where would they fit and there's an issue which well I suppose we're looking at the CHO regions versus the HSE regional health areas. So a lot of this stuff is in development. So again, the next question is the next steps. We are at the moment finalizing the service level arrangement with the HSE. We are meeting, meeting with stakeholders. And again, here, and I have an ask here actually, because we're meeting and we want to meet with nursing home staff. So that's E. Um, we want, and we will be asking in the next week or two, I suppose, for centres to engage with us, maybe to participate in some focus groups with us. Um, we would love, I know, Mark mentioned earlier on in terms of the time to reflect survey, the resident's voice. There's an element of us wanting to hear the resident's voice in terms of this program as well. So we would really love your engagement and we will be, I suppose, reaching out to you to, to help us with that. The regional coordinators for the National Nursing Home Programme, as I've said, the posts were in development. Hopefully, and pretty soon, we'll, we'll be able to give you more information on that. Uh, so really, over the next few months, spring into summer, we will be keeping you updated on what's happening um, uh, for the programme, which is great. What I can say is one of the final things that we did decide to do as part of the national program is uh, we have end of life care resources uh, that we want to disseminate and we want to make sure that every nursing home in Ireland has access to uh, this is our in, this is our keepsake pouch, our handover bag for families. We have a booklet on when someone you care about is dying in a nursing home bereavement leaflets and we've developed and this would be the bereavement team have developed a number of um, bereavement leaflets understanding grief adults grieving the death of a parent living through the death uh, of your spouse or your partner when someone you care about is bereaved the grieving family and importantly grief in the workplace as well because we are uh, we are affected by residents and by when residents die as well and how we can support each other and um, so there are a number of leaflets that we would be sending a certain amount and we also have our compassionate toolkit our toolkit for compassion end of life so hopefully we're aiming by march maybe beginning to the mid of march we will be able to actually disseminate this to every nursing home in the country um, and we hope that it's a valuable resource for you in supporting you in the work that you do so again i'm just going to say thank you at this stage i know it's got a lot of information any questions you have, you can put it into the chat function and we can answer it at the end of the presentation or email, email the team, Keol at Hospice Foundation, um, and we will endeavour to answer any questions and to keep you up to date uh, on what's happening with the programme. So thank you very much. And I am going to stop sharing now and hand you back to Mark. Thank you, Kate. That's great. Um, again, yes, just to highlight to everyone that, you know, the, the, the nursing home program is ongoing. There's going to be a lot of changes coming and we'll keep you updated as much as we can over the next few months as we progress through that. Um, next up, we have uh, Martin Cormican coming from the HSC here as well to to uh, give us some uh, rundown on the guide, the latest guidelines. Um, we would ask people if you do have some questions for Martin, things, please drop it into the chat function and uh, we will have a little question and answer afterwards as well. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, and a few questions that people have put towards as well in the registration link as such. Do we have lift off? We do, I hope. We do. We're seeing your full screen there now. Okay. So. Perfect. So thanks then. I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the guidance and, and thanks Mark, you flagged some questions that uh, I'll try to answer if I remember them as I go through. If not, you might remind 
them the other afterwards. Um, I suppose one of the things that uh, I frequently talk about is what I call representation and misrepresentation of infection prevention and control, um, which I like to think of as infection prevention and care because I'm a bit less interested in the control and a bit more interested in the care. Um, and um, people sometimes say things like, we can't do that because of infection prevention and control. Um, I, I can't say that I can recall a single instance in my life in this area of practice where I told anybody that they couldn't do something because of infection prevention and control. Um, my approach is usually, um, you tell me what you think the patient needs, then I'll help you to assess the risks and I will tell you how to do it with the lowest possible level of risk if that's what the patient needs. So, so, but, but I'm not saying that's the universal approach of infection prevention and control, but it needs to be. And it's certainly, it's the core value of our team of HSE Americ is we, we, we support care, we don't obstruct care. Um, um, how do you get infection? Well, this is, this is, I suppose, the background to all of the issue about um, visiting and visiting restrictions, which has all been enormously uh, difficult for, 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 for many people. Versus you get the infection from people who are infectious. In the early stages of the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about whether you could get it from objects I'm not saying you, you, you may get it from objects in the vicinity of a person who is infectious. There, they, um, people, the government of the People's Republic of China says that there was a case recently with somebody who got infected from a FedEx package, but that's not been reported anybody anywhere else in the world. And most people are very uh, dubious about, about that. But so you get it from people for all practical purposes. And if there is nobody in the building where you are today who is in, with infectious SARS-CoV-2, then effectively you can't get it. And again, that's really important because um, all of the other things that we do, all of the infection prevention and control things we do are the insurance policy against the possibility that there's somebody in the building who has infectious COVID-19. But if there isn't anybody there, then you can't catch it for all practical purposes. So then, of course, every person who enters the building poses a risk of introduction of infection. And the more the number of people who come in, the greater that risk is. And the higher the level of infection in the community, the greater the risk with each individual person. And we can manage that risk. And a lot of the guidance is about managing that risk, but you can't eliminate it. Um, and you can't eliminate it completely, um, no matter, really, no matter what you do. So infection is not the problem in many respects. Almost everybody on this call, in fact, everybody on this call is infected with lots of things and most of them aren't doing you any harm. And um, so infection is not the problem, disease is the problem and infection and disease are different things. And of course, we all know now that there are lots of people who get asymptomatic infection with SARS-CoV-2. And um, so they have an infection, but they don't have any disease if they've got no symptoms and no related consequences. So. So disease is the harm that we're concerned about as distinct from infection. And again, we can manage the harm, but we can't, we can't eliminate it for, for, uh, for everyone. And the other harm, and this is again, that, that everybody on this call I'd say is, is extremely conscious of, is that not seeing people you care about makes you miserable. And it may actually make you sick as well, uh, uh, because it's, it's, there isn't any sort of, I don't think there's any any of us who think that there's a sort of hard boundary between what we feel and what we experience and what our body is. It's 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 a whole person. So so things that make you miserable may well make you sick. And um, and and then individuals' priorities are different. And and I certainly know people uh, and have known people uh, who are very close to me who for whom the priority was that they wanted to see people and they were quite prepared to accept whatever risk there was to them of either infection or harm. But what they wanted to do, see was they wanted to see the people they loved. So from their point of view, it was, I'll take my chances. And, and the, the difficulty is that um, the chance that you want to take in room one has consequences for everyone else in the building. So if you're in a private home and you say, I'll take my chances, that's, that's, that is your chances to some extent, but if you're in a congregated healthcare setting, whether that is a, a, 
you know, whatever that congregated healthcare setting is, whether it's a hospital or a residential care facility or a hospice or whatever the facility is, if you're in a congregated care facility, uh, facility then any infection you get has consequences for staff and for other uh, other users of the facility. So the, the outline of the issue then is it's quite complex because there are competing um, priorities and, and the priorities of one person in the congregated healthcare setting may not be the same as the priorities of everybody else in the congregated healthcare setting. And trying to find a balance in all of that has been quite difficult. It is difficult, it is subjective. Um, when we do webinars on this, one of the opening slides that I frequently uh, use is the expression guidance is guidance. Um, it's not a straitjacket. Um, and, um, and I know that some people, you know, I see there's 81 people on this call, so that's 81 different ways of looking at life. And almost certainly there are people amongst this call who like to be given a very clear rule set. And, and, the, and then there are probably other people who dislike rule sets and, and lots of people who are somewhere in between. But we can't give you a rule set and that's not my job is to give you a rule set. Our rule job is to give you, is to try to provide you with guidance and support. Um, and as the other thing that I generally have said in our webinars many, many times is if you have to choose between kindness and guidelines, kindness is usually the better guide, is usually the better, um, is usually the better guide. And a lot of things that have happened that have caused huge difficulty for people have been done by people who knew that what they were doing wasn't kind, but thought that they had to do it because of guidelines um, and, and felt constrained and felt that what was provided was a straitjacket and the rules. And then sometimes people people think that there are rules that were never that that we never advised on. That you know, I come across all the time people who tell me that there is guidance that says, in fact, as recently as this morning, I had a colleague in a hospital tell me that guidelines said I should do something, and I said, no, it doesn't. Not only does it not say it now, never in the course of the last two years has the guidance said that. Um, so there are lots of myths about what guidance says and, and, uh, as well as, so the guidance itself really creates difficulties and perceptions around the guidance often creates additional difficulties and, and, and we have to kind of work with both of those. I've been very struck by through this pandemic and in other work that I've done over the years in the context of other highly infectious diseases here and elsewhere, that infection has a visceral effect of fear on people. Um, uh, I've seen people who are extraordinarily brave in, in other contexts who, who were extremely fearful when infection was in, in the frame. Um, I think it frightens people who do infection for a living are probably less frightened because it's what you're used to. Um, so you know, I, 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 it doesn't, I, I, um, and we all, I suppose, react differently to what, we, what, are, what the risks. I once worked in another country with, a, a, with, with members of, a, of the military so these were people who were trained to be shot at and that didn't seem to frighten them very much at all but the prospect of catching an infectious disease was just was, was disabling for them in terms of the fear so so handling our fear is a huge part of this uncertainty frightens people and i don't i don't give guarantees because life doesn't come like that so sometimes people say if i do this that and the other can you more or less guarantee me that i won't catch infection or that the, my my client or my the person I'm caring for one kid, and actually, no, I can't. There aren't any guarantees. What you do is it's, it's you manage manage risk and live with risk, which is what we all do every day, isn't it? So the key points in the there is a set of key points in the in the residential care guidance that have got up we put up, um, and one of those is obviously the responsibility to ensure that people have a right to meaningful that the right to to meaningful uh, re relationships is respected. Um, the importance of risk assessment uh, in in um, managing uh, the risks and in doing anything, you know. So so if people do things beyond the guidance, we would say, well, you owe it to the people you're caring for to have a very good reason for doing extra things that make their lives more difficult. So if you think that this that you need to do things that this guidance doesn't call for. I can't tell you that's wrong because I don't know your service. I do think you need you owe it to those you care for to have thought about that very carefully and to be able to explain to them why it's necessary. Um, it is essential that service providers engage with residents um, uh, and try to communicate clearly with residents about what's uh, what's happening and why it's happening. Um, 
we're encouraging service providers to make every practical effort to progress towards normal visiting as quickly as possible. And that's this is not a new thing. We've been saying this for some time now in the guidance. Um, very clearly said in the guidance for quite some time is that there is no ceiling on how often or how long a person can see uh, people if 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 they're you know in critical and compassionate circumstances. So there's nothing in the guidance that says you, you can't be there for six hours or eight hours. That and and that that has been gone for a long time. Um, incidentally, it's worth just saying that the original um, suspension of visiting uh, in residential care facilities was a government policy decision. It was not a recommendation from my uh, my colleagues and I. It was a government policy decision. My colleagues and I have never recommended suspension of visiting. Um, I can't think of any circumstances in which I would recommend suspension suspension of visiting. That was a, a government policy decision. Um, Residents in long-term care facilities have a right to refuse visitors, um, uh, of course, and, and sometimes people don't want to see visitors, and that's okay, and that's okay too. It's, it, I think one of the things we've tried to put a lot of focus on is that I understand the needs of visitors, but actually, to some extent, they're not really my concern. In a sense, my concern is is the resident or the person who's receiving care, um, and and they're the centre of it, and, and they should be able to see who they want to see with as little restriction as possible and they don't have to see anybody they don't want to see because it's their life. Um, so the guidance is on this link. The main changes in the update, so the update was published uh, yesterday, I know Monday, and it's intended to be implemented from next Monday. And the main things are the introduction of this idea of a nominated support person. So we have had a model of a nominated support partner in the acute hospital guidance for maternity services for some time. It's, a, it's been very useful. A number of people, campaigners, have felt that we needed the same approach in residential care, and we've taken that on board, and I think it is a useful idea. There's some questions about that, and the idea, and, and, I, and I understand, of course, that because um, we're all, we all live in families, and so do I, so I, I guess that, you know, why is Martin the nominated support partner and you know, Mary isn't, is a difficult thing for families. But again, the way this is framed is that a resident has the right to nominate a nominated support partner. They don't have to. If they don't want to choose a nominated support part person, if they, if they feel that that's a difficult thing and not appropriate for their family, there's no obligation. Um, and some residents will choose not to do that for, for family reasons. It, 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 so it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it states an entitlement, not an obligation. Um, you know, in this whole thing, the obligations are ours and the, and the entitlements to some extent are the, are the, are the, the residents of the service users. Uh, there are limits to that as well, of course. But so, so there's reference to a change in the context of social restrictions. And, and I think just to say here, on many fronts, we've got questions. In fact, just before I came on this meeting, one of the things that delayed me a little was dealing with a, a question of, of people saying, well, it all finished at six o'clock on Saturday morning, the whatever it was of January. And actually, no, it didn't. It didn't finish for healthcare, and we will have to move forward more carefully. So the change in context of social restrictions has changed expectations, but there are still risks and we do still have to manage them. Um, we were very clear that to emphasize that uh, there is no ceiling on levels of access because that, although that's been there for a while, it needed greater emphasis because I think people, some people hadn't seen it or, or noticed it. Um, we've removed the differentiation between facilities with high and low levels of vaccine uptake because it, it was unnecessarily complicating the document. And really there are very few, if any, long-term residential care facilities left without high vaccine uptake. Uh, the, requirement for vaccination certificate is gone. That went into the guidance because we were directed to do so by the by by a policy decision, but that's now removed. Um, we have uh, included the idea that visitors are nominated support persons indeed uh, may visit residents in multi-occupancy rooms in their own room. That I think would be helpful for, for many residents. Um, removal of restrictions or movements within the long-term residential care facility after outings and very um, particular emphasis on the fact that even in an outbreak, some level of access for people who are important to the residents should be maintained. But then, I'll finish up very quickly now, but just to say SARS-CoV-2, just how did this all start? Well, it, it, this is just general stuff. Um, we know it came from a, a, an animal, a lot of speculation as to whether it came directly from an animal or whether it came through a laboratory, and I don't know that we'll ever know the answer to that. Um, 
what caused the pandemic? The easy answer is SARS-CoV-2, but actually it's not really that simple because that virus has been in existence or something very like it in nature for a very long time. So the, cause, the pandemic was caused by the virus and by how we live and the, the way our society works and all of those things all contributed to the nature of the pandemic. Yeah. So it's complex. All of these things are there's rarely a single cause. The question everybody wants to know as far as I can see is when will it all end? And if I could tell you that, then I think I could probably retire and make a lot of money, um, but unfortunately I, I can't. How will it all end? I think what will happen is that we will see over the next few months, I hope, I guess, I don't know for sure, that will happen is that things will start to fizzle out. There won't, I don't think, be herd immunity in the sense that the virus won't have anybody left to infect. I think what's likely to happen is that we will all tend to get reinfected from time to time, but the harm that that does us will get much, much less as our immunity grows as, a, as individuals in a society. And then just finally, just to say that through all of the pandemic, uh, there's been fantastic things have happened in all of the difficulty. Uh, and, and these things didn't happen in every country. So it's a tribute to people on this call and many others that, that things have functioned, people have been cared for, um, but hard things happen too. Um, and, and some of the things that have happened and that I've been aware of and that many of you are aware of are hard to explain and I can't explain them in terms of refusal of, of uh, outright refusal of access that has happened in setting, settings where I don't understand. But there was also great kindness. And I have to say, I work with an outstanding team and that's my, uh, and then I'll try to answer any questions, Mark, if there are questions. Thank you, Martin. That's great. And um, we do, we have a few questions coming in there. There's a, a few practical questions that um, a number of people sent in beforehand. And there's a couple of questions coming up there in our chat function. Um, I suppose one of the one of the practical ones we're being asked here now is, you know, um, should non-vaccinated visitors wear a mask when visiting indoors, uh, especially if they're in dub double occupancy rooms? That's one question that came up. Yeah, I, 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 the general guidance would be that um, visitors are asked to wear a, a mask in 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 the, if they're moving around. In any case, whether they're vaccinated or not vaccinated, um, I think there's a an element of judgment that's required here. So the advice would be that a person who's not vac if if somebody's coming if a resident is seeing somebody who's not vaccinated, and I, in my opinion, and it says this in the guidance as well, indeed that the resident. Um, the resident should be aware that that represents an increased risk to them. The resident may be happy to accept that risk, but they should be aware of it. Um, the, and the, the person who's not vac, anybody who's coming to visit is advised to wear a mask in the general areas within the healthcare facility. Um, if they're vaccinated and they don't wear the mask when they're visiting a vaccinated resident, and assuming all the other things have been done as well as making sure that they don't have any symptoms and they're not supposed to be self-isolating and so on, then the risk is very low. If, um, if they're in their own room and if they both choose not to wear masks, I, I think we have to be kind of grown up about the fact that recognizing that individuals make choices and the increment in risk in there, if the, if the non-vaccinated person has no symptoms and if they're following everything else we've asked them to do, the risk associated with taking off the mask, uh, what I call the incremented risk of them taking off the mask is very low. There is no zero risk. So sometimes, as I said in the talk, people think that if I, if I do all of these things, I'll be, I'll be safe. Actually, that there is no zero risk. We have to look at what's, what's the difference in risk associated with that. And for a non-vaccinated person visiting somebody, if they're visiting me in my room, and if we both choose not to wear masks, the, the difference in risk in that setting compared to if we were both wearing masks is actually quite small. Um, so we, yes, we advise it. Should I be putting my head around the door, the, the door every five minutes to check that they've got their masks on? Absolutely not. That would be intrusive and not appropriate. And if they're in a multi-bed area, I think, again, some of the stuff is you advise people. But I don't think there's any point in going to war with people about this. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't think it does anybody any good. And uh, so I think advice and support and encouragement and explaining to people why you're asking to do it. But at the end of the day, I think we have to leave a certain amount of, uh, you know, there has to be a certain amount of discretion in, 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 as a starting rouse with people about things is often not terribly productive for us or them. That's not a, that's not a straightforward yes or no. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it is a very complicated question, I suppose, in practicality. 
um, which we it's come up a couple of other times there now as well, where people are are questioning about, um, you know, uh, respite beds or people coming into nursing homes and things like that initially, and about um, having um, having to isolate for a period of time. I think there's a little bit of confusion on exactly the time periods people might have to self isolate and things like that in, in those particular circumstances. Well, we've tried to clear that up in the in the current version of the guidance and try to make it simpler what the duration of um, uh, of and, and again if people are coming in there is an important distinction i suppose to make between restricted movement and 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 isolation so so self-isolation or isolation is what we do with a case somebody who is known to be infectious somebody who is a contact or who is being admitted and there's a concern about we ask that they restrict their movements that doesn't mean that they have to stay in the room all the time there's no reason why they can't walk down the corridor on their own if the corridor is quiet or they can't go you know so so it's it's not um it's it's not quite the same as if somebody who's known to be infectious where you're actually trying to get them to stay in the room really substantially all of the time if they can unless they have access to the outside um, and the, the period of time that's required for um, for restricted movements for people who come in is, is we, has now been shortened uh, to um, has been shortened to but actually you know I, I have to admit I've, re I've written so many guidance documents in the last week that they're they're trying to just I, I'd have to go back and check but my recollection is that it's now shortened to 10 days is the period of um, of restricted movement for, for somebody who who comes in um, and again that again is guidance and you know it, people some degree of judgment may be involved but we are trying to shorten that as much as possible and certainly we've changed the guidance to say people who go on outings that they shouldn't have any restricted movements when they come back and the new guidance also um, uh, says that we need to move beyond restricting social activity within the residential care facility we now actually have to get that was much more limited in the previous in this version of the guidance we're positively saying that we need to be getting back to less restriction on, on um, social activity within the residential care facility okay um, we also have another couple of questions popping up here in the chat function. Um, somebody's asking about, uh, is, it, is it reasonable to do a PCR test on admission if uh, they have had a negative one 72 hours prior? We don't recommend that. Um, what we said is if they had if the recommendation of somebody's coming in for respite is that they ideally should have a test before they come in in the 72 hours prior. If they had that test in the three days before they come in, then there, is no, there isn't a requirement for them to be retested on admission. Um, we've one from Margo here as well saying how long do you expect masks to be required by staff and any advice on unvaccinated staff um, unvaccinated staff the HSE's approach and I don't know whether that's a question from a HSE colleague or not but within the HSE unvaccinated staff are, there's a requirement for the, the healthcare facility to have a process in place to assess the risks associated with unvaccinated staff um, I would emphasize that that an assessment of the risks both to the staff member and to the people they care for. The reason I make that point is that again it goes back to the thing of you know the I'll, I'll take my chances thing. Well um, if I'm working in a healthcare service and I decide I'll take my chances and I don't want to be vaccinated under the law that does not excuse the employer from the risk associated with my work. Um, the employer I, I don't have that discretion as an employee to decide I'll take my chances. Um, the employer is responsible for my safety. So the employer needs to consider the safety for the person who hasn't taken the vaccine, and they need to consider the safety that risks to other staff and to, and, and so there's a risk assessment process that is recommended for people who have not taken the vaccine. And if the assessed risk associated with their role is, is high, then the HSE guidance is that they need to be reassigned to other issues. I have seen a number of people, obviously, who are very unhappy about that. Um, in fact, I had correspondence just today from somebody who is saying, why are we still doing that now that the restrictions have been lifted? And again, it goes back to that point that many restrictions on social mixing have been lifted, but the journey for healthcare back to baseline is going to be a longer journey with greater care because of the nature of what we do. I don't know when healthcare workers will be able to stop wearing uh, masks. That, that you know, There's a major piece of policy decisioning, decision making around that. I do expect it will happen, um, but I, I can't give you a timeline um, for it and I expect that it would probably be gradual. The other thing I suppose just to say about that is as with so many things is people want different things 
Um, there are some healthcare workers who would feel that they would they don't they want to wear masks anymore. There are other healthcare workers who feel that they want to wear masks all the time, and there are other healthcare workers who feel that they want to wear respirator masks all of the time. And sort of trying to manage all those different expectations is, is one of the challenges of, of trying to work through this and, and manage people's fears and, and, and competing perspectives. Um, I think we have one last question from Mary there as well, who's also asking about the the isolation period for unvaccinated persons. Um, I know Martin, you were saying that you were you were you know trying to trying to, to think of those. I think it was fourteen days as far as I, I think remember it's, it's longer. Days. Yeah, it's longer for unvaccinated persons. For un, un, unvaccinated persons, we're sticking with the fourteen days, yeah, which not with any enthusiasm, I have to say, because it would be you know I know what that means for people, but it's that issue. And a lot of this is, you know, as I said at the talk, is, is subjective and difficult. But I think the, the, the unvaccinated people, there is a greater risk there. They, so, so we have kept the 14 days for unvaccinated people. But is that just even the person that is just coming in at an admission? Sorry, this is Mary, um, what do you call it? Didn't be admitted into the unit? If they're so, unvaccinated, then we say that they should yeah. restrict movements for 14 days, yes. Right, right. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's the last um, few questions we have for you there, Martin, that are coming up here on the screen. Um, again, if anyone else has anything they think about afterwards, we can always send on to Martin afterwards. Um, things I've all always left to say is thank you for coming along, Martin. Um, you know, again for answering some of our questions today, and uh, and thank you for everything you've done over the last couple of years as well. And um, during the pandemic, I know um, a lot of the guidelines have been very helpful, um, for for a lot of our coal network and things as well to be to be able to to guide and navigate through an awful lot of very uncertain times. So thank you very much, Martin, for coming along. And I suppose, uh, as they say, right back at you, Mark. I just acknowledge and thank everybody who is on the call for the work that you have done over the last couple of years, and and. And indeed for lots of helpful comments and so on which, which a lot of our guidance has been shaped by comments and advice from colleagues so thanks to everybody for all the contributions they've made on that as well wonderful thank you very much okay so now that uh, leaves me now to uh, hand over to uh, dominic campbell from the irish hospice foundation who is going to uh, lead us to a talk on um on some of the the arts tools um, for residential care Thank you, Mark, and thank you to all the other speakers. I'd also like to thank uh, Lynn Neggett, who I can see there, gives a wave. Hi, Lynn, and uh, to Geraldine O'Keefe, who is there. Oh, there you are, fantastic, great. Um, so we have everybody on the call. Uh, my role this afternoon is to talk to you about a new initiative uh, from the IHF's Art and Cultural Engagement Programme, um, which is really focused on you. It's focused on on staff, on HSE staff, on care staff. And to do that, what I'm going to do is invite uh, Lynn and Geraldine into a conversation. And before I do that, I'm going to share a little video. But I want to talk a little bit about why the arts and health problem. You might think after listening to Martin and 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 talking and and listening to to. Kate, actually, that this is, you know, what's the arts got to do in this? What's creative work got to do in this? Well, it's all about health and well-being. It's all about that side of the house. And I was struck when I was listening to both of them speak that a, a lot of what they were saying really echoes what we're trying to do or what we're about to try and do. So uh, Kate was talking about the fact that you are a community. You're a community of practice. You're a community of interest. In the groups that you work in, you're a really quite tight community who's gone through an awful lot in the last two years that's possibly made you even more connected. I was struck when Martin was saying that, you know, that that infection frightens people and uncertainty frightens people. Well, infection is contagious, but so is joy and so is hope. And if the negative can make people sick, then perhaps the opposite, hope as an infection, joy as an infection, can do some of the good work. It can certainly help people to look out for each other. And that's why the arts programme got started 12 months ago in the Hospice Foundation. It's about creating opportunities for people to make sense. It's about creating opportunities for people to navigate their own way through the difficult landscape of death, dying, grief and loss. And to illustrate that, I'm going to start by showing you a video. So Mark, if you like, let me share the screen. And then if I remember to click the right button. 
to share sound and optimize the clip then I can play this oops really tough for everyone you know our family and our friends this is the first year we won't get a Christmas card from her she's beautiful handwriting this leaf will now kind of replace her Christmas card you know yeah Irish Hospice Foundation has always done something with the arts. This project comes from a series of seed grants that we've been able to make, which are small grants to communities or to individuals, to artists, to explore or process loss and grief. Today I wanted to provide my community with an opportunity to remember and to give them an opportunity to grieve, to heal, Really was. When I came down, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I knew I knew what the idea was, I knew what the plan was, but it, it definitely felt a little bit uplifting, yeah. And it was very, very therapeutic, I think. And to meet everybody else who has also suffered the loss of somebody. So it was very interesting and touching. So I wanted to show you that at the beginning to illustrate some of the things that we've been doing over the last 12 months. It was a little project funded by our Seeds Initiative, um, which was made by Glasshammer Studios, by Michelle, for the ladies of her community. And Michelle has a glass making studio. She invited people that live in a neighborhood to come in and make something for, for Christmas trees, a little decoration. And uh, the response was uh, hugely important and significant for the people that, that were able to make it. In fact, it kind of caught us slightly by surprise. And we've realized uh, we now have 29 projects like that working in different ways across the country going on at the same time. And as we've got more eloquent about managing and developing and supporting those projects, we realised there was an area that we were missing and the area that we were missing is really ones that are staff focused. So when people run the kind of work that I do and when it comes into health institutions, it's very often patient focused. It's very often focused on that community. And so over the next few months, what we're going to start is trying to work out how we make an intervention that works for staff. A little tool, a little something you can put in your pocket, a little well-being health initiative, a useful thing. And what we've realized already is that one of the things that's a challenge for those kind of projects is people are time poor. They have very little time. That it needs to be mobile. It's, it needs to be something you might share at an SMT or you might keep in a pocket for yourself. And the way that we're going to try and develop this thing that we don't quite know what it is is by commissioning uh, artists with those kind of skills, with those kind of sensitivities. And we'll road test those little 10 minute interventions at these kind of meetings in the same way that for the last few months, for last year, I was doing little wellbeing sessions at the end. So that might all feel a bit abstract, but it, so I thought, is there another way that we can try and explain how this work is working? And so that's why I've invited Geraldine, hiya. Is your mic on? Hi Dominic, hi everybody. Hey, how are you doing? Good. And, and Lynn, how are you doing? Are you there as well? You might as well turn your mic on. 
Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Yeah. So, uh, so Geraldine is in Tip, and uh, it's the Newport Women's Shed, and Lynn is in Moyle Road in St Michael's House residential setting. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to both of them a little bit uh, to get them to explain what they're doing, and then we might kind of show how that uh, is going to inform the kind of work that we're going to try and develop over the next few months. So I'm going to start with Geraldine. Hiya. Um, Geraldine, tell us a little bit about, tell us a little bit about where you live and, and the quilters. Okay. Well, I live in a very rural area and um, it's only since September that I found out about the local women's shed and I got together with Shona and um, I'm a quilter. Started out doing quilting as a hobby and um, I've made a few for people that um, they're called memory quilts and what they, I do is make them out of people's clothing but um, myself and Shona had a discussion about how we could help our local ladies since the pandemic and since things have been people have been isolated and people have been grieving but haven't been able to share their grief and um, we applied for the grant and the idea was to make a quilt, show the ladies how to make it and um, lead them in it. And it, we've only really had a couple of nights doing it because of the restrictions. But um, so far in our last couple of nights, the ladies have absolutely loved it. And it's a great way of connecting. You mentioned the memory quilts and that you'd made a few of those. Tell me a little bit about those. Um, basically, a lady gets in touch with me, somebody belonged to her has passed away, usually a mother, um, and ask me to use their clothes to make a quilt out of that they can keep as a memory. I make, it's easier to make the cushions, there are memory cushions, I've made a few out of, say, men's ties, mm -hmm. and I found that people that, that I give them to, they, they get a great sense of peace because they can hug the cushion and they feel like they're hugging the person that they're missing. So it's a, a great sense of, of um, the, it's just lovely to see the reaction when they see it. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely thing. Do you always get, is it always uh, older people? Is it always partners? Is it all kinds of people? All kinds, all kinds. I've made cushions for, there was a young lad, um, he was only 28, that passed away and his friends gave me his shirts and um, he had a say, and I actually have a pinned in my room, every day is a gift, not a given. He was only a young lad and they asked me to make a memory cushion for them. And I made it with the arms so that they were kind of wrapping around the cushion. And they were young lads and to see their reaction when they saw the cushion, it gave me a great, I really, I felt so good for doing it for them. You know, it's a great sense of achievement too. It's a fantastic thing that you're doing through quilt and it's really gorgeous. And um, just, uh, so you've only kind of managed to do the two meetings because of COVID, but now I guess it's. Yeah. And and what have the what have the conversations been like? And uh, yeah, what have the com what's it been um, like? A lot of the ladies kind of stepped back when I said we were making a quilt, and it was like, mm -hmm. mm, that's a big thing. But when I broke it down for them and showed them, like every lady is going to make, well, hopefully every lady is going to make just one block, and it's it's like a fourteen inch size block, so it's doable. And if every lady makes one. And then I put them together. And our idea then was that I make a little heart shape and anybody they, they've lost, I embroider their name on the little heart shape. We'll put it into the centre of the quilt. Mm -hmm. So that gives them an opportunity to talk about their grief, to talk about how they're feeling and to honour their loved one as well. And and is there, do, will they be working all together at the same time? Or do they work off on their own or...? We've been doing it in groups of five because it's quite intensive, so I wouldn't be able to manage more than five ladies. So we take five this week, five next week, five the week after. But the ladies that are with me for the first week, they get an idea of what to do so they can take it home if they want to. And if not, if they're not confident enough, I say, look, just bring it back next week and we'll do it again together, you know. And I guess each person becomes an expert, so they each one teach one kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. you know, I know how to do that. Come yeah, on, exactly. you? yeah, because I yeah. mean, there are there are 50 women plus in the club. Now, they're not all going to do blocks. They're not all into sewing, but um, there are at least 30 ladies who are interested in doing it. And you couldn't really teach 30. I can demonstrate it, but you need to be hands on to do it. So there's and there's great laughs and great chat. And I think they feel a lot more relaxed when they're 
distracted sewing that they can talk about the person that they're doing it for. You know, they're not, it's not intense and it's, it's a chance some of the ladies have cried a little bit, but I mean, you know, it's nice. It's a nice way to remember them as well, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. And there's all that great advantage if you're, you're doing something, you can see something, your hands are yes. occupied, you, you know, you have a sense well, of value and purpose sense, and meaning. Yeah. And, uh, sense of achievement as well. When they see that finished quilt, they'll all go, oh my God, I made that. You know, yeah. it'll, it'll be great for them. It really speaks to the idea of building your life back around things that, yes. that kind of comes out of the grief research. Lynn, Lynn, you work in a very different kind of environment, but I think there's already patterns. But tell us a bit about where you work. I do. So I work in a large day service for um, people with intellectual disabilities. Um, we have an aging population here. So they're a group that have been together for a very, very long time, more than 35 years, some people, and they've even have gone to school together. So um, a group that I suppose know each other very well and have been, you know, friends for years. Yeah. And um, you've got it's a residential centre or day care so or day, we're, di we're, we're day service here and um, a lot of people though from here would live in a residential setting and attend here then during the day and so what sort of things happened over the last two years the daycare presumably closed or yeah yeah and it was a huge loss to people i mean we're only really getting back to normal now um and hopefully it continues, you know, the way we're going. But yeah, and, and even that myself was a loss to people that they couldn't attend their, their day service. We really only had a skeleton um, staff and maybe some like provision of outreach, but for the most part, we were we were closed. Yeah. So um, you saw the call out for the seed grants and you put in an application. I wonder whether you'd like to tell people what you've set out to do. Yeah, and we were lucky enough to, um, to secure one. So I suppose our concept is to engage our service users in creating um, a series of mosaic artwork um, installations for a memorial garden. Um, so it'll provide a place of quiet, um, I suppose, calm for reflection and connection for service users, many of whom are grieving the loss of lost loved ones over the past number of years and, and not non, um, I suppose, COVID related, just deaths that have happened because we are an ageing population here. Um, and I suppose for people in our community coming to grips with this kind of loss can be really difficult and it can require, I suppose, specialist support from, uh, um, you know, from us and other specialists to try and help people come to terms with their emotions, to, you know, to understand and recognise and process them um, around the issues of grief and bereavement. So we have found um, a fabulous artist. He's an expert in community arts facilitation. And he is going to um, do a workshop with us where we'll create these uh, mosaic pieces. Um, so and I suppose within um, the disability uh, community, um, people don't often have an opportunity to access, you know, um, fine arts of this calibre and be involved in, you know, in fine arts in this way. So it's going to be um, hopefully a really, you know, meaningful and hands-on experience um, with the visual fine arts and really, I suppose, a therapeutic process. And we are aware that conversations we're, we're going to, we we're going to try and facilitate conversations throughout the workshop. But um, what we felt what might be good to be to get a little help in that area, because as a staff team, we didn't feel that we were you know, fully equipped to deal with um, the conversations that might come up. So we have um, engaged the help of um, a community arts therapist uh, and drama therapist, Brafney, who will, the day before the workshop, he's going to lead um, two different workshops, one for staff and one for service users. Um, so I suppose the one for staff will be how to support service users around those conversations of grief and loss. And then for service users, it's a general introduction around grief and how to reach out support, reach out for support if required. So that's going to very much form part of the process um, and inform how we go about our conversations then for the for the mosaic workshop. It's great. And and what occurs to me about both of you is that you, it kind of fits within the the bereavement period. So that the work that you do is is at the low level of, of 
challenge and you know where, where people have difficulties that with a bit of support they'll be fine and what you can also do is signpost so uh, so Lynn very much in your by bringing in Breffney what you're doing is working with the staff to signpost the support that they might need and you've got both things going on at the same time that you you're really working with the whole community to use more road um, and you come up with a really nice project where there's something for each individual but then when you put it together it becomes a a bigger you know, garden piece but also it's each individual's journey through their own personal grief or their own personal bereavement and it also connects together at the, the larger level and, and we're doing from both of you what do you hope will happen you're both at the kind of early stage so I'm really delighted that you come along to talk to people when you're at the beginning but, but what do you hope will happen over the next mm, couple of months uh, Lynn you might go first and then uh, yes yeah. So I suppose we have our workshops planned for the 21st and the 22nd of February and um, hopefully we'll have our installations out in our garden space shortly thereafter and as the summer months come in you know people will be able to go out into the garden as I said it'll be a space for quiet reflection. I'm just hoping it'll people really engage with the garden space as it is. It's, it's a sensory garden space so it'll just be another lovely element and it's nice because from our um, canteen there's a glass door that looks out into this garden space so even if the day isn't great visually people would still be able to see these installations you know and it'll just I suppose I want to um, reflect that it's a celebration of you know people's lives as well so it'll just I just think people really um, you know I suppose connect with it and you know yeah, yeah. Geraldine what about you what, what's your hope for the next couple of months well definitely it's it's a project to bring ladies together and they'll have a sense of achievement mm -hmm. they'll be able to honor their loved ones who have passed on and they'll feel in a space where they can talk about it but they don't have to if they don't want to but they know that everybody is basically in the same boat so the idea is we're, we're going to finish the quilt quilt it and then we're going to donate it to Milford Hospice and they're going to raffle it. They have um, like a, a fair and uh, it's around Easter time, I think it is. And they're going to raffle it and it'll raise funds for Milford Hospice because Milford Hospice, on my own personal experience, my own man passed away 12 months ago and we were very, very lucky to have Milford Hospice. So it's my way of giving back hmm. as well as allowing these people in the shed to have their opportunity to do what they need, yeah, they need to do. It's really obvious with all of the SEAS projects that we're supporting and working with at the moment that there's these, you know, that, that anybody that works in a hospice or anybody who works in, in care also lives in a community and people that live in the community often go into the care and it's not a hard division between the two. So um, it's it's lovely to be able to support projects that, that are able to do that. I'm, I'm interested in asking everybody else from the from the things that you've heard and you might stick something in the chat what is it that you think would be really useful to bring into your teams is there anything in, in what uh, lynn and geraldine have been talking about mm -hmm. that would be valuable for you or likewise is there something in the way that they're working that, that yeah, we couldn't possibly do that with us which might be equally useful While you're doing that, Aoife Neil, you have a question. Um, oh, sorry, I thought we were doing it for everybody. Yeah, no, no, you're grand, you're grand. <laughs> this is a matter of either way it works. You no, know, it's actually, it's more that has it has reminded me of, um, I previously worked with the HFH. I was one of the first staff um, employed on it um, and was there for 10 years. And while I was in that, doing that, I was actually coordinator for the Royal in Donnybrook, which is where I am now, working. And at the time, we, we actually got this absolutely beautiful bronze tree with a kind of a waterfall in it. And we did a, a thing of when somebody died, there was a copper leaf, or it's a copper tree, actually, sorry. And, and there was a copper leaf engraved with the person's name and the family 
the, were given the leaf and then at a year anniversary or the, sorry, it was put on the tree and the, the family then um, came back and at the first anniversary they would they would could could take the leaf or leave it there. And if this this has just kind of reminded me of it, particularly the glass leaves there. And since I've come here to work, it's actually been sitting idle, <laughs> not used. And when I saw it, it kind of broke my heart. So I feel a bit motivated now actually to look at trying and getting it re-established because I, I, I thought it was quite a, a beautiful thing in terms of mixing the arts, the ceremony, the, the memorial kind of piece of it. And I think the just the, even the materials that were used and all of that kind of thing. So it's motivated me to try and get it up and running again. Good look. It, it's also nice to hear, you reminded me of that thing that quite often there's, you know, an art project will get started and then because it doesn't fit in with the life of the hospital or the life of the care centre, it, it kind of has a short shelf life. So one of the things that we want to try and do is come up with something that, that fits in really well with people's daily routine, the kind of thing that you can do when you're having a cup of tea or the kind of thing when you need to take or can take 10 minutes out. So I guess, you know, the healthy equivalent of a fag break, which wouldn't be anything I should really say in a call like this, but it's that kind of like little 10 minute slot. Um, Mary O'Keefe, Mary O'Keefe says, uh, uh, useful timeout supporting of each other, recognition of individual loss, grief, something sustainable. So yep, sustainable again. How do we, how do we make something that people can, we think of it as putting it in your pocket. How can you put it in your pocket and carry it around with you so that it's 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 there when you need it, when you want to reach out for it? Um, and some of you, we might have, you might remember, we did those. We tried little um, acrostics, little uh, poems, making up simple poems in ten minutes. So those kind of those kind of tools, I guess, like almost like a recipe book. You know, here's ten things that that if you need to reach out for it, you can try these things. So that's what we'll try and develop over the next um, over the next while. Uh, Lynn, yeah. and what would you advise for that kind of project? What What do you think? So, if you're if you're working something that's staff focused as opposed to resident focused, what might it need to do? I would just, I suppose, as we did, a big learning for me was in, to enlist the help of somebody that could guide us in the right direction. And I know yourselves have been fantastic as well. And um, it's not something. I suppose at the start I was willing to go it alone and I thought, you know, everything would be fine. But as I've gone on, I realise it's much more, um, I don't know, I, I would just say um, seek support in if you need it. And especially in, you know, knowing how to guide conversations. I know it's probably different with everybody because um, we work with people with intellectual disabilities. They require... Um, a lot more, I suppose, specialist help in terms of recognizing emotions and, you know, it can be hard to, uh, uh, oftentimes we're deciphering people's behavior, you know, and trying to determine how it is they feel. So in order for somebody to be, to be able to recognize their emotions and process it, it, I suppose it's done a little bit differently, maybe. And that's where Breffany is going to come in um, and it will just help us to, I suppose, guide the, the process. Um, Yeah, sounds great. I'm just messaging, messaging Mark on the chat so, so it runs like a smoothly oiled machine. Geraldine, um, same question to you, really. What would you recommend as we start this project? Okay, as from my own personal point of view, mindfulness. Um, if it's something you love, and in my in my um, area, that's sewing. So if you pick something that you love that can distract you for five minutes, two minutes, be it listening to your favorite song, um, reading a page of a book, whatever it is, find something that gives you that little five minute, two minute break away from whatever it is that's, that's upsetting you or that you're feeling overwhelmed by. Um, I love mindfulness and meditation myself, but the sewing, when I'm sewing, I don't think about anything else and I'm concentrating on what I'm doing. So I don't, if I'm upset, it takes me away from that. Or if I'm distracted, it takes me away from it because it takes your whole attention. So it 
keeps you occupied in a positive way. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so that's that's my challenge for the next six months, I guess. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I know I will ask for help on a regular basis. Um, and thank you for everything that you've given us because we couldn't have done it without you. The grant we couldn't have done, got the fabric or the sewing machines or anything. So we're very grateful. It, and we're delighted because it just it, this is what we're trying to do. You are doing what we're trying to help make happen. So it's both of you. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming to this. Um, in in kind of wrapping up this session and, and handing back to Mark. Um, so what we will do, what the the IHFH, IHF art section is going to do is we will be uh, bringing in commissioning. Uh, we think about four artists, artists with skills and expertise in this area. They will develop short little interventions and we're going to trial them out with you. So we're going to take that little 10 minutes at the end of a session and try something out and, and get some feedback, whether it works, whether the, what they invent, what they make up, what they try out, whether it works. And then we'll refine them and the ones that are almost like the ones that get the most votes we will polish up and make more available, more widely available to people. So, um, so over the next few Kjold and HFH and, and various other network meetings, we're going to be introducing these people and trying out um, a little well-being intervention, a little arts and well-being intervention. And uh, your feedback would be fantastic. Your your engagement would be great. And the more we get from you, the better we're able to make it work. Um, so thanks, Geraldine. Thanks, Lynn. And back over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, guys. Um, yes, again, to just reiterate, that is the, the plan over the next few networks is to, to have a regular slot with Dominic and the arts team there where they'll be developing these. So um, we also, there will be different correspondence and uh, people are happy, people are on our call, contact list and things like that as well. They might reach out to people and pass on information as they're developing it over the next six months. So thanks a million guys for coming along. It was great. Um, especially Geraldine, actually even hearing you talking there about the ties and the pillow and stuff and the cushion and stuff like that, it made me instantly think of my own grandfather who I, I don't remember not wearing a tie and I'm kind of going, God, how what I wouldn't give to have something like that now, you know, so it's absolutely wonderful hearing about those kind of things uh, that are happening out there, you know, and such simple ideas that, you know, all it takes is a, a little bit of information sharing and uh, can be such a benefit. So thank you very much, guys. Um, I'm just going to start wrapping up here now because we're coming up to um, closing time here as such. Um, just want to highlight, as we always do, um, about the Irish Hospice Foundation's bereavement support line. And this has been going on for the last uh, last couple of years, just to flag that it's still there. Um, it's still running Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. I mean, that this bereavement support line is obviously there for anybody who's who's having challenges during bereavement. It's not just for family or residents or people like that it's also for staff um that it's it's for everybody who, who might have challenges of bereavement and, and that line is there uh, for anybody from night from 10 a.m to 1 p.m and um, monday to friday so just to highlight that there with you again um it just leaves me to uh point out as well that we do ask for a little bit of feedback if we can from our participants um, because uh, it's how we develop these, it's how we, um, you know, come up with different topics, it's what people are asking for, it's what people want to know. So uh, your feedback is really beneficial for us. Um, it just inside in the chat function there, we'll have put up a Menti link. It, it'll take 30 seconds to fill out. Um, if, if you have any feedback, that would be fantastic for us. If any upcoming uh, networks and stuff that you want to talk about or want to know more about, uh, we might have access to different speakers that can come in and do that for us for us um if you can't get if that link isn't working for you you can go to menti.com also and um, that you will see up there on the screen and you can uh, type in that code that's there up on the screen as well that's another way of getting in if you're having difficulties um with uh, the link there as such um just to also say that we do have um, our next network is penciled in for the 23rd of march uh, we'll be sending out um invites and things as we progress over the next few weeks uh, so keep an eye on your inboxes for that i'm aware that there's a lot of information being sent out uh, from lots of different um stuff that's happening with the ihf and things like that so we'll try to keep it to a minimum but there's a lot obviously happening with the new nursing home program and things as well um so just keep an eye out for uh, invites that will probably be going out near the end of the month as such um as well 
So thank you for all the speakers that came today and thank you for everybody for coming along uh, to our first network of the year. Um, it was a great way to start, big gang of us here. Uh, there's definitely renewed optimism out there. I think we can all feel it. Um, you know, there's a, the, 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 the pressure is kind of lifting off the shoulders a little bit, but there's still an awful lot to process as we go along and what has happened over the last couple of years. And you know, exciting times ahead with, with things like the National Nursing Programme that's coming in that is going to be a big benefit uh, to, to all centres throughout the country. So as we develop more and as we know more, we'll share with you and we hope to all see you again in uh, March.